Glenn Vanderberg. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, as the title of this talk suggests, this is kind of a weird talk. And my clicker is a It's kind of an amalgamation of several different things that I've been thinking about or working on for a while. Um, I'm going to spend some time talking about naked objects. Uh, ever since Dave's keynote on the first morning, I've kind of had to scale back some of my graphics uh, in this section of the talk. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to talk some about naked objects because I think it's an important idea that, you know, it kind of uh, um, had some, a moment of popularity for a couple of years, uh, and, and recently we've stopped hearing about it so much, and uh, I think it's worth revisiting. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what I did for Y Day, and uh, my Y Day project was to start building a naked objects framework in Ruby uh, that I called Pursuit. <laughs> and I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about Rails. Um, you're allowed to talk about Rails at RubyConf. You're just not allowed to pretend that it's the same thing as Ruby. So uh, I'm going to talk about Rails and uh, especially, especially active record and active model, which I think fit very nicely into the naked objects idea and uh, make it easy for someone who's interested in that. And I'm going to talk about the relational model and some things we can learn from that and maybe apply to the way we do domain modeling in Ruby. Um, some of you uh, may at RailsConf or at some other regional conferences this year have seen me give uh, this talk, Real Software Engineering. Uh, just as a word of warning, if you're expecting something like that, uh, uh, don't. Uh, that talk is the product of about 10 years of thinking, and it's, uh, I think, pretty well organized and coherent and, and tells a story that all fits together. Uh, this talk is kind of the opposite of that talk. Uh, this talk is a talk full of half-baked ideas that I've been thinking about for 10 weeks, and uh, I don't think it all fits together nicely yet, um, but uh, that's not so bad because if you've read this wonderful book by Stephen Johnson, Where Good Ideas Come From, uh, good ideas come from half-baked ideas and, and uh, different things colliding with each other in interesting milieus and, and ideas being taken out of one venue and, and used in another, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, this talk, which uh, I think is aptly described by this picture, <laughs> is the start of some good ideas. And in fact, Dave in his keynote uh, on the first morning of RubyConf played kind of nicely into my hands because uh, my goal for this talk was to do exactly the things that he challenged us to do. I want to inspire, I want to diversify and bring in some ideas from, from uh, parts of our industry that might be a little bit unfamiliar. Um, and I'm definitely making something new uh, worse than it's been done before. So let's talk about naked objects. Um, I'll get into the history of it a little, in a little bit, and I, I, the history is important and interesting, uh, but just first an overview of what it is. Naked objects is um, a model of building applications that provides a user interface that essentially allows the user to directly manipulate domain objects and directly manipulate the relationships between those objects. So here is an example of a naked objects interface. Um, you can see that in one part of the screen there is a list of primary domain entities, uh, expense claims and employees in this case, and uh, using those entity placeholders you can uh, issue queries of various kinds and see groups of individual domain objects that match that query uh, against a particular entity type. And then from there you can get a hold of one or more entity objects and edit them directly and, and build relationships between them. We have an employee object there and uh, you can edit fields of that, that object and uh, a claim object which has multiple uh, sub-objects of expense items and those things. You can do a host of uh, sort of universal actions on objects. Create a new one, uh, edit an existing one, uh, 
duplicate an existing uh, uh, expense item, uh, and each kind of object has its own custom actions that it declares, that you can directly uh, act on the object and tell it to do things, in essence call methods on it, straight from this interface. This particular interface is a Windows graphical uh, desktop user interface. Um, but the idea of naked objects is that programmers focus on building the domain model. You define your business objects, uh, the relationships between them, what constitutes uh, valid or invalid uh, business rules, uh, build the logic in there about how business objects act on each other and relate to each other. And the user interface is generated for you. Uh, this user interface is a part of the .NET Naked Objects framework, and the programmers who built this uh, particular application didn't code on the user interface at all. That was generated for you as a wrapper around these, these objects. Hence the name Naked Objects. Uh, the framework uh, gives you direct access to edit and manipulate and see business objects in the domain. And nothing restricts you from having just a sort of desktop drag and drop user interface. Um, the .NET Naked Objects framework also supplies a web-based user interface that runs in a web browser. And the mechanisms and user interface style is a bit different, but all the same pieces are there. You can see the list of entities. Uh, you can issue queries and get collections of a particular kind of entity. You can edit those entities directly. Uh, execute sort of universal actions on domain objects and execute custom actions uh, that are particular to that kind of domain object. Naked objects appeared uh, in our field about the same time as Ruby's introduction in the West. The pickaxe book, the first edition of the pickaxe book, was introduced, was released uh, 10 years ago last month at the Uppsala conference in uh, Minneapolis in, 2000, uh, in the year 2000. And uh, at that same conference was uh, the first time uh, that Richard Pawson, who uh, uh, in, invented this idea, uh, although building on a lot of other good ideas from the past, spoke about the naked objects idea and uh, started uh, trying to promote it. Um, and it actually goes back to a lot of earlier ideas. The small talk, the original small talk group at Xerox Park, uh, one of the things they were trying to do with small talk for the purpose of building end user applications was to introduce direct manipulation. And when we hear direct manipulation today, we tend to think of you know, dragging and dropping things uh, on, on a screen. And that's one of the things they meant by that. But what they really meant was that the application should provide you with direct access to the objects in the domain that you were using, and they may be in a, in a drawing application, things like uh, circles and squares and text blocks and things like that, or in a business application, something like this. And that team at Xerox Park had uh, t-shirts made that said, don't mode me in. Uh, they wanted to get rid of modes and um, programmed workflows in computer applications and instead uh, let them choose their own workflow based on direct access to the objects in the business domain. Um, that idea has persisted in some ways and Pawson started trying to resurrect it in a very explicit way by introducing the idea of naked objects and building a framework for that. Um, so it's been around for uh, about 10 years, the same time as most of us in this country have been aware of Ruby. And um, there have been some other implementations of it. My friend Eitan Suez did an alternative Java-based naked objects framework called JMatter. Um, I'm not going to walk you through all the little pieces of this interface, but it, it has all the same ideas. And um, uh, it, it has the ability to provide alternative views of objects with particular kinds of characteristics. 
And all these frameworks have in common the idea that you focus on building the domain objects, and you may need to annotate those objects uh, either internally or externally in some other ways to make the user interface uh, be exactly what you want, but the user interface is built for you. This idea should be kind of familiar to those of us in the Rails world, um, because Rails has a couple of things that, that really borrow from this idea a lot. For example, um, smart scaffolding systems like Active Scaffold can be viewed as a simple naked objects framework for Rails and Active Record. The focus of, um, of Active Scaffold is really more for a data administrator, being able to look at the data and edit it and uh, uh, correct it and enter data easily, uh, not for somebody actually performing business tasks, but nevertheless, the idea is pretty much the same. There's another active scaffold screen editing a, a, an individual entity. Um, in the original Java-based Naked Objects framework, uh, they had a drag-and-drop swing-based user interface, which was uh, pretty ugly. And um, they talked about having pluggable different interfaces and a web-based interface, but they hadn't quite figured out what that should look like yet. So as a proof of concept, they developed a textual console-based user interface uh, wrapped around naked objects. And as near as I can tell, uh, I haven't been able to find that recently and download it and run it, but I don't have to to show you an example of what a textual naked objects framework, uh, naked objects interface looks like. Because every Rails application has one. It's called the Rails console. And you can see uh, in this example, I have uh, a little application, and you have to run the console in production mode for all of these things to work so that it will preload all the classes. But by asking Active Record Base for its subclasses, I can find the list of domain objects in this domain. And so there's room, session, speaker, and talk. Uh, this is loosely based on the example that Aton uses in his JMatter documentation. And uh, if I ask speaker to tell me about itself. It tells me the various attributes that a speaker has. And uh, talk is the same way, um, a little more involved. There are some things in those lists that are more sort of active record infrastructure uh, attributes like ID and uh, speaker ID. But you can also ask an active record object for its content columns. And it will uh, give you a list of, of columns and fields in that object that filters out the administrative stuff. Right? Raise your hand if you've never done this. A few, but most of us who have worked in Rails um, have used the console and played around with objects, and effectively you're using a textual <coughs> interface to a naked object system. <coughs> Carrying this example a little farther, that's the, the classes uh, idea, but you can also create new objects, so uh, uh, there's me and there's Patrick Ewing uh, speaking next door. Create new objects, persist those in the database, interact with them directly, and you can also create objects and establish relationships. So here's uh, my talk associated with me as a speaker, and there's Patrick's talk associated with him as a speaker, and we add the title to it, directly manipulate that, uh, save it, and then we can do queries and ask the, a set of related objects things about themselves. Um, and this is where I highlight the wonderful uh, scheduling that Chad did. Uh, I love the fact that these two particular titles are running next to each other. Um, so, how many of you have ever heard of Naked Objects before? About half the room, which is about what I expected. Um, in 2003, 2004, uh, it started gaining some little bit of popularity and uh, then kind of faded. And it's interesting to look at why that is. You might think, well, it, it uh, faded from view because it's just a bad idea. But the history of our field is full of great ideas that failed for the time because not because they were bad ideas, but because 
it, the time just wasn't right, or uh, things were, were changing that uh, made it not the best time or not the best fit, or sometimes just because people didn't understand it. I think naked objects failed for a couple of reasons. One being that uh, uh, the initial frameworks weren't very good, uh, and the people who wrote them uh, will cheerfully acknowledge that those frameworks uh, weren't, very good, weren't very good. Another reason is the goal of naked objects. Uh, the goal of naked objects is to provide an interface for domain experts within their domain. A naked object system would be an inappropriate interface to put in front of a novice user that did not understand the domain. The idea is uh, that, that a novice user needs uh, a little more guidance, uh, an understanding of what to do next and what's required and what's optional, whereas a domain expert will know these things and can choose their own workflow through the system. And uh, the kind of workflow style or wizard style task-oriented interface that are so good for novice users are actually really frustrating for domain experts because sometimes uh, you want to enter information or take actions in the order that the information becomes available to you and uh, not in, in the order that's prescribed by the interface of the application. But at about the same time that Naked Objects was first becoming popular, we were starting to figure out how to really build interfaces on the web that would allow novice users to do things for themselves. Real, effective, self-serve, shopping, browsing, search, uh, uh, airline reservation booking systems. And uh, so the emphasis shifted from building interfaces for domain experts working, say, in a, an airline reservation center, call center, to uh, building an interface that was more appropriate for novice users, uh, people going to AmericanAirlines.com and, and booking their own reservations and things like that. But again, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's a wonderful idea. And for my Y Day project, I started working on a naked objects framework in Ruby that I call Pursuit. Um, and it's a funny name, and it's a why-ish name, and that's kind of why I chose it. Um, but it also reflects some of my uh, opinions about naked objects and what's going on. Um, and this is the embarrassing part of the talk, because uh, uh, I had hoped to, well, it's embarrassing for one reason, because I just realized I never plugged my laptop in. Um, it's also embarrassing because uh, I don't have really working code for Pursuit to show you. Um, yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, so, uh, but the reason for that is, is partly because, as usually happens, uh, you know, things got busy and I, I didn't have the time I thought I'd have. But it's also partly because my first attempt taught me a lot about naked objects and about active record and active model and the strengths and weaknesses of those tools for data modeling that caused me to kind of throw away my first attempt and uh, start over. And it's really those lessons that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, uh, Pursuit is a naked objects framework, and, and it's built on active record and active model. And as I've shown you, um, those tools already have much of what you need to be able to do a naked object system. And that's obvious because um, you can do it right from the Rails console, and effectively that is a uh, text-based naked object system based on active record and active model. But I mentioned that um, while the focus of naked objects is uh, to allow you to focus on the domain model and building your business logic and, and uh, all that stuff that we do in the models directory in Rails applications, um, sometimes programmers do have to give hints to the naked objects user interface to get it to build an interface that really works right. And um, nobody who's interested in naked objects is really happy with that idea. And um, as I began building uh, Pursuit, I started thinking about the things that were missing from active record and active model. And um, 
I initially started sort of building those in as annotations in the user interface layer. But the more I thought about it, and this was the lesson that caused me to throw that away and start over, the more I thought about it, almost everything I realized I needed to do to give hints to the user interface were actually things that would be helpful as a part of the data model itself. And this really isn't surprising because when you take something like Active Record and Active Model and try to take it out of its context within Rails, certainly a lot of people have built custom applications that don't use Rails and just use Active Record and Active Model. But if you take it out of there and try to build a new type of framework on top of it for other kinds of applications, you learn things. And the deficiencies of that initial uh, tool, Active Record and Active Model, become more apparent in the new context. And one of the things I learned was that a naked object isn't really naked. It needs a different kind of clothing. It needs adornment. In particular, it needs to be highly reflective and give information not about itself necessarily, that's the naked part, but also about its kind and constraints that it has and its behavior. And so the original name that Richard Pawson used uh, before he changed to Naked Objects because he thought it sounded snappier, I suppose, the original name he was using was Expressive Objects. And I think perhaps that's a better name in some ways, and it gives us more insight into what's really going on. An expressive object isn't truly naked It needs to have something wrapped around it that shows you how to interface with it and shows the interface what to do to build the right window on the front and the right interface. And Active Record has some of those things, but it doesn't have all of those things. And so the third part of the talk is what it really means for an object to become naked, what it really means for an object to reveal itself to a framework so that the framework can present it to a user in the appropriate way. It's not really about becoming naked. It's about having a different suit made for you for every application. And the tailor <coughs> needs to know the right information to make that suit. And as I began trying to do that in Active Model, I noticed some holes in the facilities that Active Record and Active Model give you for that purpose. So let's talk about this. Richard Pawson said in a, in a note to me, he, he noticed that I was giving this talk and, and uh, contacted me and, and we had a little back and forth about it. And he said, um, time and time again, we have found that the constraints imposed by a naked object's user interface very often force you to do a much better job of domain modeling. And I've seen that myself. And furthermore, um, so he started uh, doing the work on the .NET naked object system uh, fairly early in the life of, of C Sharp as a programming language and um, had to build in a lot of custom declarations and things that you needed to add so that the UI could do the right thing. But later, um, some of that stuff was subsumed by .NET itself. So it's very <coughs> rare indeed that, that the constraints of a naked object's UI force you to do something less than optimal in the domain model. And then the, the custom declarations that he built, our annotations, serve purposes much wider than naked objects, and other annotations have appeared from other corners of the .NET community that turn out to serve our needs perfectly well. And they've been able to deprecate most of the custom stuff that they originally built into the framework for annotating and describing your data model, and are now using things that are a standard part of the .NET persistence framework. And, um, those map very nicely to the declarations and annotations that we have in Active Record and Active Model objects. So let's look at what classes give us in Active Record. And I'm talking about Active Record and Active Model because um, uh, there, there are things that a naked, naked objects framework needs from both. Um, and I'm trying as much as I can as I build this to depend only on Active Model uh, but nevertheless, for persistence and some of the other things, I need to, to deal with active record facilities as well. So henceforth, I'll just call it uh, active model, and, uh, but you'll know that I'm talking about the blend of the two. 
Um, the classes can tell us about their attributes. And that's really important for us to provide an interface to editing an object uh, for a domain expert. And they can tell us about their associations. And that's useful as well. Because we need to be able to uh, provide an interface for a user to build associations between objects and uh, uh, the right kind of objects and things like that. And or be able to query from an object to find its associated objects. An object can tell us about its validations. And that's uh, useful because we might want to provide a different interface for different kinds of constraints on uh, a variable. And we do this by hand all the time in Rails applications. Think about the different interfaces you provide sometimes for phone numbers uh, as opposed to just comment strings or, or something like that. And that's based on, although we don't do it automatically, it's based on the validations. And just before Rails 3 shipped, um, uh, the team finally made validations nicely reflectable. Um, associations have always been, uh, had, had very good reflection support in Rails. And um, now in, in Rails 3, uh, validations have good reflection support. So you can query an object about its validations and learn about those. So that opens the door to being able to do some of those things automatically, which is nice. But I have an asterisk there. Um, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later because validations occur in another place. What active record objects don't tell us is very much about their uh, actions, the things you can do to them. Yes, you can use Ruby to find out about the methods, um, but uh, for Pursuit, I've needed to build a, uh, a facility to declare in much the same way that we declare in Rails uh, controllers, which of these methods are kind of meant for public consumption uh, and, and not just the kind of public protected private uh, style thing that, that is consumption by other programmers, but the things that end users are allowed to do. Additionally, uh, we need to, for those actions, provide information about the types of arguments and the types of things that you're likely to get back from them. So that's something I'll be uh, improving. I've got the prototype of that working and um, not quite happy with it. Associations provide us the type of the object on the other side, and they, they can tell us whether there are one, or one, uh, there's one object there or many objects there. What would really be useful that they don't provide is some notion of the expected cardinality of that association, if it's a, a, a one-to-many association. Or do we expect to have a few objects in that association? Uh, tens, hundreds, thousands? Um, you can imagine that that information is necessary for choosing the right interface to let somebody search for objects that are associated or uh, browse them or, or add new ones, whether you would have just a simple drop-down list or some kind of a fancy uh, autocomplete search uh, field or something like that. This is obviously useful for a user interface. Can you think of places where it would be useful to actually have it represented in the data model? I think it would be very handy to have objects know it might be useful for uh, heuristics about uh, how to prefetch associations if you were asked to do that, whether to do it via a join or by a separate query. And this might not be uh, a pure constraint that would be enforced, but it would be a hint of we expect to have just a few of these things, or maybe 20 or 30. Uh, something like the way we specify color depth uh, on computer displays these days, hundreds, thousands, or millions, not uh, an explicit number. Now, attributes. Active model tells us about the type of attributes, which is very useful uh, for building the interface. And we already have things in Rails, including scaffolding and uh, facilities like Formtastic that exploit that type to automatically provide the right kind of interface. Um, constraints, uh, which it gets from the database whether it's nullable or not, for example, and whether there's a default value. 
and validations again. Uh, the reason I have the asterisk event around validations is that uh, validations are now uh, introspective and you can reflect on those and learn about the validations, but they're not generative. Um, without building special code, you can't uh, learn what a validation means in terms of how to provide the right user interface for it uh, or things like that. It's merely, uh, okay, you provide a value and I'll tell you whether it's good or not. Um, so it would be nice if they had a more descriptive or generative capability as well, and I don't quite know how to achieve that. But finally, there's one more thing that I think Active Record and Active Model would, would benefit from that we need for naked objects and to build a good naked objects framework, but I think would also benefit us in an ordinary Rails application. And the key to this, uh, I'll introduce by giving you a quote from a friend of mine, Scott Davis. And Scott uh, uh, is uh, familiar with Ruby and Rails, and, but he's chosen to go another way. He's a, a Grails developer and evangelist. Um, and one of the things he really doesn't like about uh, Rails is the leakiness of the active record abstraction and uh, the way SQL leaks through. And I'm not here to argue about that. I'm actually kind of a fan of, of it. But uh, recently, Scott said this. Anytime you require a developer to specify SQL before source code, you're putting the cart before the horse. And I don't actually agree with that, necessarily. But while I think he's wrong, he's not all that far wrong. And the way I would describe uh, how the, the leakiness of the active record and abstraction really hurts us as, as uh, developers using it, whether in Rails or not, is this. The domain model should not be unnecessarily constrained by the limitations of the database. And uh, in active record and active model today, um, if what you have to represent is uh, it maps nicely to one of the built-in database column types, you're in good shape. If it's not, well, if it works out nicely as an association, uh, you can define a separate table for that thing and a separate model class for it, and you're in good shape there as well. But if what you really want is a field in your, uh, in your record, in your uh, model object, with a custom data type, uh, you're not out of luck, but Active Record doesn't make it easy for you. And there's this notion from the original, <coughs> original relational model of domains. This was a part of, of the original proposal of the relational database model. A domain was a custom data type for a column. It would, it would be formed from a base data type plus constraints. Uh, on that, uh, and the idea of the domain would, it would, was that it would exhaustively list uh, or um, uh, describe all of the valid values for that call in the database. And uh, in the original proposal, there wasn't uh, really any notion of composite data types that were formed for different base from different base data types. Some databases have, have added that support later. And the idea was that you would really never uh, declare a column that was just an int or just a string. You would create a domain for what that meant in your database model and then create your column that way. And that idea was never widely used because it was never really well supported by uh, database implementations. And um, because it was kind of heavyweight, and I think because in the database schema is not really the right place for that. But maybe the domain model is the right place for this kind of thing. And so what do we do? Um, do we want to provide support for a field in active record, or rather better support, because this field, this support does exist, better support for a field in active record to be an instance of some custom Ruby class? There are a couple of ways to do this in Active Record now. Neither of them are widely used for good reasons. They're kind of clumsy, uh, overkill in some case. Um, just as a double check, people are filing in. Am I over time, or did another talk just let out? OK, I'm not over time. 
Um, <coughs> so, uh, do we use classes to represent uh, the idea of domains and have uh, uh, fields in our active record and active model objects that are instances of a custom Ruby class and, and put the, the stuff we need there? That might seem too heavy. It also, uh, if the, a domain is a type plus constraints, then we really want the domain to be able to carry its own validations with it. And that kind of seems like a clumsy idea, uh, having to define a class that is not necessarily an active record uh, instance, but has validations with it. One of the facilities for doing this in active record today is aggregations. And again, it's not widely used, it's kind of clumsy. You can say that the slot attribute is composed of two other underlying attributes in your table. In this case, it starts at and ends at. And you can say, represent that composite, that aggregation, as an instance of the class time interval. How many of you have used this in uh, active record work? Now, that's about what I expected too, probably about 10%. Um, it's not widely used, um, and again, validations are kind of clumsy in that case because the validations are on the, uh, the, the larger scale active record object and not on that uh, individual class. So places where you, you use this, you have to duplicate those validations. Um, there are several reasons why this doesn't work very well. But the, yes, question? Now, now in Rails 3, it's like validations are a separate include and do just a root class and then include them in the root class. Yeah, you can mix in, uh, mix in the validations, yeah. Um, there, there are ways you can do this that are a lot easier in Rails 3, and that's kind of what I'm moving towards, is a, a refinement of that idea. So, uh, but you can see that there is a need for a better facility like this. And as evidence of that, I want to show you two widely used plugins that uh, work in a similar way and may actually use this under the covers, but have had to do a lot of extra stuff to do what they really want to accomplish. And the first of those is money. Um, you declare uh, a money uh, price attribute using the money gem in your active record object, and that assumes that there is a column uh, in the database called price in cents. And it uh, wraps that in an implementation of the money class and, uh, or an instance of the money class and, and does nice things for you. And you can override that default mapping and also define a second field that represents the particular currency that that uh, money value is represented in. And uh, so this is sort of like a smarter composite. Uh, the, and again, I don't know, it might use composite, or it might use the uh, composed of under the covers, but it has to do uh, a lot of other stuff to uh, really make this work. Uh, the other example that would benefit from a, a smarter sort of domain support in uh, Active Record as a part of our modeling is paperclip. Uh, so you say, uh, has attached file avatar, and um, you, can, you can override all this, but essentially uh, this expects you to have in your migrations uh, these columns, avatar file name, content type, file size, updated at, and uh, uh, Paperclip sort of subsumes all four of those columns for you into um, uh, one instance of whatever the class is that Paperclip wraps, Paperclip wraps those in, for what it's called. Um, uh, so that you can manipulate those four fields as a single entity. And this is a great example of, of uh, kind of rich domain support that um, uh, I think we need and, and the right, uh, right implementation of domains in active record and active model would make much easier than the current implementations of money and paperclip. So, um, as I said, I'm a little embarrassed not to have uh, uh, to, to be giving a talk that's half-baked ideas without working code, but on the other hand, that's kind of fitting for a project that began on Y Day. Uh, so what I have been playing with and, and thrown out and not really been happy with yet is ideas like this. So in an active record class, you could call, uh, describe a domain attribute that is slot. This is very similar to the composed of example we saw earlier, 
But instead of specifying a class, you specify a domain. This attribute is, uh, slot is of the domain time interval, and that time interval domain has been defined elsewhere. Um, and you can override the default mappings if you want to, just like with proposed of. But um, I toy with uh, the idea of defining the domain as a class that's a subclass of, of a, a domain base class. Um, the default mapping is that it uses fields start and end. That's what would be uh, overridden by the, uh, the usage declaration up above. It includes its own validations. It validates uh, that the start and end attributes are present. Uh, and um, it validates that end comes after start uh, using a, a method that does that work. Um, and, and I tried this and wasn't exactly happy with it. And, and the, the latest implementation I have um, uses more of a declaration like this, where you declare the domain time interval. And uh, then within a block there, we describe the class name that, that implements this and, and validates presence of uh, validations and other things. And uh, I'm, I'm playing with where this should go and if it's appropriate, an appropriate if there is an appropriate place for these domain declarations to go in the context of an application. Um, and if I don't find a, a place that feels right, I may end up going back to the, uh, the class uh, option. But um, this is all ideas that are coming to me as I try to build a completely different kind of application framework around the base of active model and active record. And that really doesn't surprise me at all. When you take something out of its context and then try to generalize it in a different context, um, the deficiencies become really stark. Things you might never have noticed before, things we we're happy to do manually in Rails applications, uh, we need to do automatically in uh, a naked objects framework. And then uh, the test is, are these things that we need to add useful, again, back in the context of pure data modeling in, in a Rails application? I don't know the answer to that yet. I think, though, that uh, I will end up uh, writing gems or plugins that add this uh, straight to active record or active model, if that's the appropriate place for some of them. And uh, uh, we can experiment with doing better data modeling and uh, more thorough modeling of our data in Rails applications. And perhaps uh, that will have the additional follow-on effect of allowing us to uh, simplify controllers and views and do more automatically than we're now having to do manually. Um, and a quick conclusion. When you take something you're familiar with and try to use it in a different setting, deficiencies that you've never noticed before will become obvious. And so it's always a useful thing to do. The past is really full of good ideas that failed. They weren't bad ideas. Some of them were bad ideas. But there are also a lot of good ideas that failed. And knowing our industry's history and some of those ideas that failed can really suggest uh, useful things that would solve problems that we face today. And there are two, ca two such cases here. One is naked objects, and one is the idea of domains as uh, proposed in the relational model by E.F. Kai. And then finally, uh, because Dave in his keynote so nicely preempted the last uh, uh, things I was going to say, um, you know, what Dave said, uh, uh, diversify yourself. Uh, Go outside of what's comfortable, learn new things, learn old things, uh, build new things, or, or redo old things worse and find out why they are the way they are. Um, it's a, a fun exercise. Thanks very much. Those are the first credits.